<coughs> oh, thank you, Alice. It's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, indeed, we do go way back. <laughs> but uh, it was, I was Alice's teacher very briefly in several complex variables, I think. Since then, I've been learning from her. <laughs> so um, what I want to talk about today is a kind of classical theme. It's the, it's the Dirichlet problem. So generally speaking, that means you fix, you fix a manifold, and in that manifold, you fix a, a compact domain with smooth boundary. And, um, and then you ask the question, given a continuous function on the boundary of that domain, when is it possible to find a function u, which is continuous? You'd like to know that there exists a unique, in fact, u that's continuous on the closure of the domain and has the property that, that one, it satisfies some um, nonlinear equation that depends on, well, it depends on x as well, and, uh, and then restricted to the boundary, um, it's equal to phi. Okay. Roughly speaking, that's the idea of the Dirichlet problem. And, uh, so now what I want to talk about today is how to go about solving this, how to go about solving this equation for very, very general, fully nonlinear equations. And part of what I want to convey is a slightly different philosophical point of view. I mean, technically, it won't be that different, although there are some techniques which are surprisingly effective and not usually used, but, um, but one, of the, one of the main points is that, oh, by the way, this is all work with Rhys Harvey. And in fact, he's kind of the major criminal in this, in this dark affair. Um, he's, uh, he really has been fascinated by this and has been a lead. Anyway, uh, one, of the, one of our points of view is that, and this is something that follows Krylov, it goes back at least to Krylov. You should throw away equations where the equation means that you're setting some function of u, du, and d squared u away and replace it with a subset. So the simplest example is you take the Laplace operator, which is equal to the trace of the Hessian, and instead you replace it by the subset where the Hessian is greater than or, e greater than or equal to 0. And then the equation is recaptured by looking at the boundary of this subset. Okay? So that being, so you, you look at this half space where the Hessian is, is in symmetric n by n matrices, uh, where the trace is greater than or equal to 0. And now a function is called subharmonic if, if its Hessian lies in this set at every point, and it's harmonic if it lies in the boundary. And I'm going to adopt that terminology for very, very general subsets. Um, and the, there's a good reason for it, because it turns out that much of what we know about subharmonic functions, which are extremely um, malleable, right? Subharmonic functions are, are, are not differentiable in general, but, uh, but you can take the maximum of two and it remains subharmonic. You can take decreasing limits and so forth and so on. It's a very nice class of functions. And this, this extends from this classical notion of subharmonic to fully nonlinear equations. And that's not news to the people in the in the field, but, um, but it is going to be part of what I, what I want to say. Another philosophical point is that of duality. I want to talk about, um, I want to show you that if you take this set point of view, then every, every sub-equation, every one of these subsets, has a dual sub-equation. And they really are dual. They take the dual of the dual and you get it back. And, and, and these two, this dual pair of equations, they, they play a kind of symmetrical role in all of the analysis. And that's one of the things that I, I want to emphasize. In particular, when you're trying to look for geometric conditions on the boundary of a domain that guarantee existence, you can't just look at the equation. You always have to look at the dual equation. And when you're thinking in this dual mode, that's more or less obvious that this should be true. Um, OK, so, so let me be a little bit more concrete now. Um, I'll go here. So, so x is a manifold, and I'm going to denote by 
j2 of x, the two jets of real valued functions. Okay, this is a vector bundle over x. And, um, and now, by a subequation, I'm always going to mean I'm always going to mean a closed subset in J2 of X. It's going to, I'm going to insist that it have certain properties, which we'll get to in a moment. But just for the moment, a subequation is just this. And, um, and an equation, let me go put the corresponding equation that we're interested in is the boundary of F. Okay? And now let me put a little bit of meat on this. In particular, if you have a if you have a C2 function uh, on X, then the definition is that U is F subharmonic. if the Hessian of u is in f for all x. And u is f harmonic if the Hessian lies in the boundary of f for all x in space. OK, so this is a completely sensible definition for C2 functions. And um, now let me give you an example of why this might be a reasonable thing to do, and in fact, often a quite reasonable thing to do. So let's look at what did I want to do? Just look at oh, let me get the wrong place. Right. So suppose I take X to just be an open subset of of R n. Okay. Then then I can consider a set I'll call P. And so these are jets of the form X, and then the classical notation is this. R is, is um, a, a real number, P is a vector in Rn, and A is a symmetric n by n matrix. Okay? And I want to forget all the information except A, and A should be a non-negative symmetric matrix. Okay? So these are the two jets of functions um, Whose, whose Hessian at every point is greater than or equal to zero. All right, then, um, then the boundary of P, you see, is, is contained in the set X, R, P, A, such that the determinant of A is equal to zero. Because exactly the boundary is where here, you, all the eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. You're on the boundary if the smallest one is equal to zero. Okay? Now, the important thing to notice here is that, is that this is not an equality. The determinant locus is much bigger than this set. Yet, conventionally, in the classical literature, when people sat, people, this is the, this is the mont Jampier equation, right? The real mont Jampier equation. And the classical solutions of Alexandrov were always of this form. He always looked for convex solutions, convex solutions. So he was secretly, or maybe not so secretly, <laughs> doing exactly this. He was, he was looking at this subequation and, and then taking the boundary. Um, I can do exactly the same thing if x is open in Cn. Then I can define p, make it pc, this to be the set of such that of jet such that the Hermitian symmetric part of A is greater than or equal to zero. I'll come to what the Hermitian symmetric part is in just a moment. I'll write it out explicitly. But the but when you're in C n, then every symmetric real two n by two n matrix can be written as a Hermitian a matrix that commutes with jet, with multiplication by I and one that anti commutes in a trivial way. And this is just that part that commutes with I. And it it's a symmetric matrix with real eigenvalues, a Hermitian symmetric matrix with real eigenvalues. And, um, and then you can ask that it be, those eigenvalues all be non-negative. Okay? And now again, you take the boundary, and you get the complex Mont-Jampier equation. Or you get a branch of the complex Mont-Jampier equation. So this is a simple. This is at least a 
an idea of what this is about. Now, of course, This is a homogeneous Monchamp pair equation, right? Yeah, yeah, it's important to say that because it's, not, it's the Calabi Yao equation that <laughs> comes to everybody's mind, right? No, no, this is a homogeneous Monchamp pair equation, although we'll be able to make it inhomogeneous later on. Um, so now, I want to extend this to upper semi continuous functions, so let me set some notation. USC of x for an open, for a manifold x, this is equal to the set of upper semi continuous. <laughs> I'm not going to write that out. Functions with values in the interval which includes minus infinity but not infinity. So you allow these functions to be minus infinity, in fact, on arbitrarily bad sets, valued functions on x. Okay, so that's definition. And what I'd like to do is to say what it means for something to be f subharmonic when it's only in here. Okay. Now, there are several definitions that you can take in Euclidean space, and I'll come to that in a while, but the definition I want to take here will just be the classical viscosity definition that goes back to Crandall and Lyons, and, um, which really works marvelously well. So we say that if you have a function, upper semi-continuous on x, then this is um, f subharmonic. on x if for all points x naught and for all functions phi, which are of class C2 near x naught, the condition that u is less than or equal to phi near x naught and u equals phi at x naught implies that phi, which does have a Hessian, or it has a two jet, uh, the two jet at x naught of phi lies in f. Okay? So you use comparison functions. So you, you, you can't take derivatives of u, but if you have a smooth function. It means the two jet of phi at x naught. It means the zero. It means it means it means phi at x naught, d phi at x naught, and the Hessian at x naught of phi. All of that, okay. Since this is really a general subset of the of the two jets, this has to be in local coordinates. If I write it this way, I'll come to that later. Okay. Now. Um, Okay, so, so with this definition, it's rather remarkable. There's a theorem. This is sort of well known. And it's a, so I want, I want, oh, I want some notation. Let me get this fixed once and for all. So f of x is the set of these. Okay, so f of x means the f subharmonic functions on x, and um, and if I have a compact set K, then I'm going to use the notation that f of K is equal to those functions which are upper semi-continuous on this compact set, such that their restriction to the interior of k is in f of the interior. This definition makes sense only for open sets. But if you have a compact set, then this is the right definition. Something which is upper semi-continuous on the closure and on the interior, it satisfies this, this definition. So you want to apply this if k is the closure of the interior? Well, I think it doesn't much matter. I mean, we won't be interested in sets with, with spines, but um, yeah, there's. I don't think I'm going to make any statements that aren't aren't true when k is pathological. And, I mean, really, the point is that it doesn't have to have a smooth. It doesn't have to be something with a smooth boundary. Um, okay, so what's the theorem? The theorem is one. If I'm given two functions, 
which are uh, in f of x, then the maximum of u and v is in f of x. That's nice, right? It's closed undertaking the maximum of two functions, which is really useful when you're doing, when you're trying to construct something that, that contradicts your assumptions. Uh, if I have a sequence in f of x, uh, and if either uj converges monotonically downward to u, or uj converges to u uniformly, then that implies that um, u is in f of x. So this is closed under, under decreasing limits and closed under uniform limits. Thirdly, um, if I'm given any family in f of x which is locally bounded above, and I take u to be the function which at any point x is just the soup of u of x over u in the family. Well, it's not so good that this is automatically f subharmonic, but it is true that the upper semi-continuous regularization, which you get by just taking the, the, the limb soup at every point, whoops, <laughs> u, the upper semi-continuous regularization of u is in f of x. And the fourth property, and this is the zinger, is that if, if u is C2 and it satisfies the, the condition that we wanted, that the Hessian at x of u is in f, for all x and x, then that implies that u is f subharmonic in the viscosity sense. So, I'm sorry, the, the you, you defined f of compact set. So this is assuming that you have defined f as an open set, you are defining f of a compact set. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. This should be interior of k. So if k has then it's just all the upper semi-continuous functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's confusingly general. <laughs> but it's all you need. I mean, it's, it's all you need to say. But gen I mean, in general, you should think of this as a domain with boundary. The boundary might be bad, you know, but I'm going to consider smooth boundaries today. All right, so um, I made no hypotheses here. And in fact, the surprising thing is that 1, 2, and 3 hold with no hypotheses whatsoever. So, the, and it's just an argument that you assume and then you get a, a consequence. The problem is that 4 needs a hypothesis. And so this is if condition P holds. And I'm about to tell you what that is. If you don't have the condition P that I'm about to state, then, then the, the C2 functions that you want will not be of this type. Basically, you won't have any interesting subharmonic functions. And the top three are void. <laughs> they're just they're, they're, they're statements about the empty set or a set of, of, of zero interest. So, um, so what do I mean by I think I'll just deal with two of these. So what is condition P? So I have to say a little bit about about jet bundles. So there's a short exact sequence. I, if I take the two, jet bundle, two jets of functions on x, so that simply means germs of functions modulo those that vanish to third order, right? So, and then given it, if you're taking germs of functions that modulo those that vanish to third order, you can map them onto the one jets, those that vanish to second order, or maybe I got that wrong anyway. See. And the kernel is something which is, in fact, the symmetric square of the cotangent bundle. I'm not giving myself enough room here.
Okay, so at any given point, um, these, are the, these are the functions which have critical value zero. So there aren't any sections of this guy. <laughs> but at every point, it's just the... And now, in here, there is a, there is a natural subset. And this is simply equal to those guys in here, which are greater than or equal to zero. These are quadratic forms, so that makes sense. It's a quadratic form on the tangent space. Okay, And now, the condition that I want is that, um, I'll call this condition P, is that F plus P be contained in F. This is called the positivity condition. Okay. So if you have a C2, if you follow the, the viscosity definition, if U is C2, then you see that if you have a function which, which is greater than or equal to U and a C2, then the two jet of, um, of phi will, will not agree with that of U, but it will be the, the, two, the two jet of phi minus U will be exactly something which has critical value zero and the Hessian is greater than or equal to zero. And you need all of those to be in there. So you require that if you're at any point in here, this cone of positive things must lie in there. Okay, it's just required by the definition. Now, I'm going to require two other things in general. I'm going to require a negativity condition, which says that F plus N is contained in F. And N, this is a negativity condition. So I should tell you what N is. N, which at any point is just R minus, is equal to the non-positive constants. Non-positive constant functions. So what this says is that when you, add a, when you add a negative constant, that gives you a shift of F. You should stay in F. So actually, the jets of those. There's the jets of those, right. That's right, yeah. So I should. <laughs> OK, and then there's going to be a topological condition, which is, which is a condition which is almost always satisfied in interesting equations. But you want to know that, that F is the closure. Now, for the F, you want to know that it's the closure of its interior. OK, for F, you certainly want this. And you want to know it for the fibers. Every fiber should be, if you take the interior in the fiber, Right, the fiber interior, and close it up. You get so every fiber should also have this property, and you should have that what the um, the interior of the, the interior of the fiber should be equal to um, the interior of F. Take the fiber at X. Taking interiors commutes with taking fibers. So this is, means it's somewhat regular. Okay, it doesn't. You don't suddenly pick up spines here and there. Okay, whenever I have all of these, then then f is called a subequation. So these three conditions, f is a subequation. So that's a definition. These conditions, this, this terminology will really mean that we're making these assumptions, which are pretty general. OK. In fact, those inclusions, you can replace with, with equalities if you want, right? So mm -hmm. it belongs to those. Um, right. Something. Yeah, because P has the, both of them have 0 in them. Right. right. Um, but it's uh, maybe it's psychological. I like to think that the set has the property that you go to that point and you put the cone there, it stays in there. <laughs> but it's indeed an inequality. Right, 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 right. OK. Um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to give you lots of them. Uh, 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, if you in the literature, very often people start with this, an f of, you know, R P A, and that there's a certain ellipticity condition which is written in usually a strong ellipticity condition which is written in various ways, which certainly gives you p. <laughs> and then there's there's usually a condition on the dependent variable, which corresponds to n. But again, it's it's oft, often one or the other is strict. You know, this is, it's a and Things get bad when it's not strict. And uh, the topological condition is just a mild regularity condition. It usually comes out. Now, um, OK, so now let me discuss duality. OK, so suppose f is a subequation. Then the dual equation is the dual subequation is going to be denoted f tilde. And by definition, it is, it is the complement of minus f, which is the same thing as minus the complement of f. You take the complement of f, and then you take minus it. Okay. And it's a little lemma that if f is, an, if f is a subequation satisfies those conditions, so does the dual. Okay. And, um, and now, given that, you can say what it means for a function to be, in, in this language, you can say what it means for a function to be harmonic. Did you want to make a closure somewhere? Because, I mean, oh, my goodness. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, the interior. No, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Nothing gets by Claude. <laughs> so. Well, I've seen some recent election before, but I think it's the same thing. I see you do it all the time. So now, um, so now I have a definition. If I have a function which is upper semi-continuous, then it's f harmonic. If u is f subharmonic and minus u is dual harmonic, f tilde harmonic. Okay. Now this really does put it on the boundary. You can see that the boundary of f is the boundary of f tilde. Uh, sorry, is the boundary of minus f tilde. And, uh, yeah. So, all right, so now I want to look at some really nice examples um, with this viscosity definition. Um, The first thing you can prove is that if you take an open set in, R, in Rn as your manifold, and you take this set, so let's let, let's let um, P be as it was before, right? I mean, Rn and my notes here. Yeah. So x is open in R n, and p is by definition the points x, r, p, and a, so that a is greater than or equal to zero. Right. So this basic example. Then it turns out that the functions p of x are exactly the convex functions. So this is a nice fact. Now, when I say convex, I mean the usual synthetic notion of kind of about 15 million 
definitions of convex functions, right? Well, one of them is certainly that it's restriction to every line is convex. Okay, so now what is the dual? Well, if you take the dual, I sh if you take the dual, then this is equal to the set of things such that A has at least one eigenvalue greater than or equal to zero. And it turns out that the dual functions are, in, in the Euclidean case, they play a central role. These are called the subaffine functions. On x. So I have to tell you what they are. So it's almost um, self defining term. So if I'm given a function which is upper semi continuous, then u is sub affine. If for every compact set in X and every affine function, affine meaning linear plus a constant, if U is less than or equal to A on the boundary of K, that implies that U is less than or equal to A on K. That's what it means to be subaffine. It's a very nice class of functions. It, um, notice in particular that, that this implies the maximum principle. Anything which, any subaffine function takes its maximum on the boundary. Because that means subconstants. If it's less than or equal to a constant c on the boundary, then it's less than or equal to a constant inside. But there's this problem that being, Having the maximum principle locally does not imply the maximum principle globally, but being subaffine locally does imply being subaffine globally. It, it's a global, it globalizes, which makes it nice. But in any event, it comes up quite naturally as the dual to convex functions. Notice this is a completely synthetic definition, just like convexity. And um, okay. Okay, then in this, in this sort of generality, I can say what I mean by the Dirichlet problem. So let me say that. problem. So um, suppose I'm given, again, a compact set contained in x. Um, now I had a particular way I wanted to say this. Those are, suppose you're given a continuous function on the boundary of k, topological boundary. Uh, we say that a function u, which is continuous on x, o continuous on k, um, is a solution to the Dirichlet problem, dp, on k with boundary values u, uh, phi, if, and for the equation f, if 1, u restricted to the U is F, sub F harmonic on the interior of K and 2 U is um, U restricted to the boundary of K is equal to phi. Okay? What, what you would expect. But notice that it makes perfectly good sense for any upper semi-continuous function. Okay. Uh, 
What are the subaffine functions? Yes. Well, I mean, um, well, the uh, the harmonic functions are going to be these uh, solutions of the homogeneous Mont-Jampere equation, the ones which are simultaneously sub minus it is subaffine and 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 they're convex. Uh -huh. So to be convex and minus it is subaffine means that it's it's an Alexandrov solution to the. And then one can prove some for, for such an equation because of the convexity, there are actually interior regularity results and so forth, which I'm not going to discuss. Um, so, but the subaffine functions, they're quite general. I mean, even for C2 functions, it just means that the Hessian has one eigenvalue greater than or equal to zero. So it's a lot of functions. But it's interesting that that one little condition that you have some eigenvalue of the Laplacian, of, of the Hessian, which is greater than or equal to zero, is sufficient to imply the, the maximum principle. It's the statement that minus the Hessian of U is not strictly negative. That's what it means. Minus the Hessian U is not strictly negative. It's got to have at least one eigenvalue. That's There's exactly right, that's right. That's exactly that there is, th yeah, right. In this case, the, the biggest eigenvalue is zero. So now, from now on, so for the rest of, of the time that's left in the first half, I'm going to assume that x is in Rn. And to make life simpler, because there are lots of interesting cases, I'm going to assume that f is purely second order. In other words, it depends only on the Hessian. So it's an independent. f is sort of morally contained in symmetric. It's only a condition on, on, the, on this part. In other words, independent of of the dependent variable and its gradient. Okay. And um, because in this case, there are some nice things that happen. The first thing that happens is that there's the following proposition. If you have a function, if, if you're looking in Euclidean space, oh, I want this to be also constant coefficient, purely second order constant coefficient. for the moment. So f is, you just fix the fiber and, and translate it. There are lots of interesting equations that have this property. Now there's a proposition that if you have an upper semi-continuous function on x, then the following holds. u is of type f of x if and only if Whenever you add to it something of dual type, this is subaffine. But what you add to it um, is, uh, is of type and C2. So so let me emphasize that here you're taking a function which is upper semi-continuous. V is a function which is actually allowed to be C2. So we know what this is. This is something that's easy to compute. And the statement is that, that if you start with something which is F subharmonic and add to it something which is a dual subharmonic, well, this is supposed to be F. Oh, no, this is supposed to be P. You add to it something which is dual subharmonic, then the sum is subaffine. This is p tilde. I want it to be subaffine. So in particular, so the conclusion is kind of univer universal. It doesn't depend on the particular f. It does not particular on f. Just has to be a subequation. 
So you take a subequation, you take its dual. And if you have something which is of type f and something which is of type f tilde, the sum satisfies the maximum principle, provided one of them is. But the statement here is more than that. The statement is that you can now define a function. The, the, the viscosity definition is entirely equivalent to the statement that, that for an upper semi-continuous function, that whenever you add to it a smooth dual function, it's sub-affine. So you can use the dual functions as test functions to see whether this is actually in, in F. So the E tilde is a test function. And this is an example where you can see the duality because obviously you, since, oh, one thing I, I, I think I didn't mention, but F. Given the topological condition, you certainly have that the dual of the dual is the equation itself. Okay. Now, I mean, so, and also in this in this special case, we have something. Called the subaffine theorem. And the subaffine theorem says the following. It says, if u, I'm not going to write, f, you know, f, f is a subequation. If u is of type f of x and v is of dual type f tilde of x, then the sum u plus v is subaffine. In particular, in particular, it satisfies the maximum principle. Okay. Now, this it always implies. No, this gives uniqueness. For the Dirichlet problem, because you assume that um, let's let W be equal to minus v. Then this says that if, if w minus v is equal to 0 on the boundary of k, then w minus v is less than or equal to 0 on k. So if you have two solutions, u and v are harmonic, What's it mean to be harmonic? Well, I'll say they're both f harmonic and u equals v on the boundary. Well, it means that u and v are both in f of, f, f of k, and minus u and minus v, oh, I should say w. What's wrong with me? Minus w. u and w. There we go. This is why I try to look at my Okay. So let's instead of looking at it this way, let's suppose that I have <coughs> two solutions, two harmonic solutions, okay, which agree on the boundary. This is W, which agree on the boundary. And now they're harmonic, that means that that both u and v are of type f, they're f subharmonic, and minus them is dual subharmonic. Okay? Then that means that, um, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Uh, okay. Then if this is equal to zero on the boundary, then it's less than or equal to zero on the interior. But you can flip it around. w minus u is 0 on the boundary, w minus u is less than or equal to 0 in the interior. Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so, so, so this subaffine theorem is a strong theorem. It it's, it's, it's essentially serves as a, what's called a comparison theorem. 
And um, it always implies uniqueness for the Dirichlet problem. OK, so this said, let me, is there a clock? OK. Uh, let me quickly talk about some examples. So um, so let me draw some pictures. I mean, maybe that's a better way of putting it. Pictures and examples. Well, no, I'll start with examples. So the first example I want to think of are O-N invariant subequations, constant coefficient, purely second order Hessian equations. Subequations. Because eventually I'm going to want to transplant these to Ramanian manifolds. So, so if I have um, a symmetric n by n matrix, then a, a complete set of invariants for this for this matrix under the um, under the orthogonal group are its eigenvalues. And if you want and if you want to make them somewhat canonical, you order them. So you look at the ordered eigenvalues. <coughs> And um, and now there's a little fact which is easy, easy to get from the minimax definition of eigenvalues that if you take the qth ordered eigenvalue for a, it's always less than or equal to the qth ordered eigenvalue of a plus p if p is a positive matrix. P is greater than or equal to zero. So the eigenvalues go up. And what this tells you is that, is that you can do the following. You can take any, take any set so, put this. so now let's look at eigenvalue space. So let's let Rn be equal to the set of lambda 1 through lambda n. And suppose in here I take a subset which is um, which has two properties. It's permutation invariant. I mean, when you look at the the residue of the orthogonal group acting on the eigenvalues, it permutes them, right? And um, and secondly, it has the property that when you add to it anything in a positive octant, so to speak, that is r plus to the n. It's contained in lambda. Okay, then this gives an O n. This corresponds to O n invariant equation. O n invariant equation. And um, so, So the set P that I was talking about is just the set where lambda 1 of A is greater than or equal to 0. That's the classical Mont-Jampere equation. Okay. And P tilde, the dual, just turns out to be the set where the last eigenvalue, right? That's the sub-affine case. But now look, you can also think about PQ, which is the set where the qth eigenvalue of A is greater than or equal to zero. I guess the assertion you actually want to make is that it's an O-N invariant equation that satisfies condition P. It, I didn't say that. You're right. Then, yeah, then this gives a, it gives a sub-equation. So that means that it, that means it satisfies condition P. The other, the other properties are all trivial in this case because it's a constant coefficient and it doesn't depend on the, on the independent variable, on a dependent variable. OK, so suppose I look at where the qth eigenvalue in ascending order is greater than or equal to 0. Then that's another branch of the Mont-Jampere equation. I mean, right, the determinant has, has, and the dual, it turns out, is n minus q plus 1. So these branches are dual to one another. So this is the qth branch. 
of Mon Jampier. Now there are, of course, lots of others that you can consider. I mean, it's, for example, you can consider other elementary symmetric functions. Another example is to take the kth, look at the set of A, I don't like this chalk, so that the kth elementary symmetric function in the eigenvalues of A um, is greater than zero. Take the uh, component that contains the identity matrix and take its closure. Okay? And then this is this gives you a nice, a very nice subequation. This is in fact convex. And this also has branches. Interesting branches, unless until you get down to sigma one, which is just the Laplace operator, the trace. Okay, but just just as with the right, the determinant has the determinant has all these various branches, and so do these other elementary symmetric functions, and the, the branches are where you retreat back. Okay, so you can see when first of all you have the set, this nice convex set which is the one that contains the identity. And then, and then um, there, there, are, there are further layers that go back. And in fact, this is a very general story that follows from Gardine's theory of hyperbolic polynomials. I mean, you look at homogeneous polynomials on symmetric matrices for which the identity is a so-called hyperbolic direction. And, and this story always takes place. There's a, the, the component that contains the identity is always convex, and there are, and then you can go back in these saturated sets, where, and then you, then you can associate to every, everything a, cert, a certain family of eigenvalues, and you get branches, and um, and all of these are actually subequations, okay, under reasonable hypotheses. So. Um, Let me give you some pictures. And then it's getting on. So I'll have to do this quickly. Um, so let's look at n equals 2. And I'm in eigenvalue space, lambda 1, lambda 2. Then the set P is just this positive quadrant. And the set P tilde, where you take the complement, that's everything outside it, and you take minus it. So P tilde looks like this. So much looser subequation. Um, okay. Um, draw one more picture. Suppose n equals three, then then p looks like this. It's the it's the positive octant. This is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 space. So P is this positive octant. And the dual equation, P tilde, is going to be the complement of the negative octant. Okay? So again, it's. And now. This is P, in this terminology, this is P1, um, this is P2, this is P3, sorry. And so what is P2? Well, P2 looks something like this.
That's the boundary. And here you have, and this one is self-dual. If you take the complement and minus it, you get it back. Okay, so again, the, so, so the mont ampere equation has this, this branch, the negative branch, and this is the in-between branch, looked at in eigenvalue squared. But I mean, in general, you can take really wild things. I mean, you can, you can take in lambda 1, lambda 2 space, you can take sort of any old set that's symmetric this way and, and satisfies the fact that whenever you translate this positive quadrant into the set, it stays in the set. So it can be really bizarre. OK. Um, and one of my favorite examples is the special Lagrangian equation. But I think I'm fast running out of time. Um, so let me let me just say what it is. So in in studying special the special Lagrangian potential equation, you end up looking at the following. You end up looking at the set, I'll call it F sub C which is the set of symmetric matrices that satisfy the fact that um, the sum from j equals 1 to n of the arctangent of lambda j of a is greater than or equal to c. Now it turns out that the special Lagrangian equation, when you, which has to do with something like the imaginary part of the determinant of i minus the identity minus i a, this should be equal to zero. So this is the equation that comes up in studying calibrations, and it was studied by Caffarelli, uh, Nuremberg, and Spruck many years ago in this gorgeous paper, and um, and they um, and they showed that you know what happens is that what you the, the solutions to this, I mean locally break up into into n sets where you get sort of zero, and then you get plus or minus pi, and plus or minus two pi, and so forth. And it turns out that, that the outermost ones, just as with the mont ampere you get these, all these equations. And the outermost ones are treatable because there's some convexity, but the others are much more difficult. And um, so from this point of view, again, you look at, these, you look at the set where where the sum of the arctangents of the, of the lambdas is constant, it looks like this. You take everything above it, replace it by a set. Then you have, super harm, then you have these subharmonic functions and the dual ones. It turns out that the dual of Fc is just F minus C. It's very pretty. Okay. And um, so this is another equation that I'll be discussing. <laughs> Uh, so finally, you can look at UN invariant equations. So if you, if A is in sim two of R two N, where I'm thinking of this as, as complex N space, where multiplication by I is given by this endomorphism J, then the Hermitian symmetric part that I referred to before is one half a minus j a j. And this now is a Hermitian symmetric matrix. It has real eigenvalues. The eigenspaces are complex lines. And it has eigenvalues lambda 1 less than or equal to, less than or equal to lambda n. And everything that I've said about, about the real ones applies to these. So you can write down all the same equations, in particular the complex mont ampere equation. And if you like, you can make this 4n, make this i, j, and k. This is secretly the quaternions. And then this can be, here you need to add i, a, i plus j, a, j plus k, a, k. And um, this is the quaternionic Hermitian symmetric part. 
And the same story is true. The eigenvalues are real. The eigen there are n real eigenvalues, which you can order. They're a complete set of invariants under the group SPN. And um, so there is a complex, mo uh, a quaternionic mon jampere equation, which actually is given as a certain polynomial in the coefficients. But you don't want to look at it. <laughs> this is one of the things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge sort of classical work the determinants, the, the, the taking the determinants of, of quaternionic matrices. But from this point of view, it's completely transparent. And in fact, there's almost nothing to say. It's easy to check that this is a fact, that the eigenspaces are, are quaternionic subspaces, and um, the eigenvalues are real. But the only, uh, only thing that's funny is you ignored some of the repetitions in the transpositions. Yeah, what I've done is to drop them, yeah. That's, that's right. So you get, you're sort of taking the complex determinant or the quaternionic determinant. So, um, and I will say this and then uh, maybe what I'll do is say a few more words and then we'll break and I, I will not go over at the end of the two hours, okay? But the, the, I want to reach a natural stopping point and then we'll come back and I'll talk, I'll talk then about the putting all of this on Ramanian manifolds and the basic examples will all be already in place, okay? Um, so finally, there are things that I like to think of as Grossman, uh, Grossman sub-equations, or Gross Grossman structures, let me put it that way. So this is another pathetically general. <laughs> Take any compact subset of the Grossmannian of p planes in Rn, p anywhere between 1 and n, n minus 1, okay? And then I'm going to define f to be the set of those symmetric n by n matrices with the property that when I take A and restrict it to one of these planes, the trace of A on that plane is greater than or equal to 0. And this has to be true for all C in this compact set. And um, it's not difficult to see that the dual is the set of A for which there exists a point in this set such that the trace of A restricted to XC is greater than or equal to zero. And um, now, this is what got us into the business in the first place, because there are lots and lots of interesting examples of this kind. And uh, one example is to just take the compact set to be the whole Grossmannian. Um, and if P is 1, you get back convex functions. Uh, you can take P to be the, uh, you can take P to be equal to 2 and look at the two planes which are actually complex. And then you're going to get standard plurisubharmonic theory, the complex the complex version of uh, the complex mon Um But, but you, you can also take the whole P gross money and you, uh, well, I'm not going to discuss that. The, the case that interests, two cases interest me a lot. One is the case of a calibration. So if this is a calibration, which means that phi on any unit simple vector is less than or equal to one, unit simple, simple vector, then. So phi is now a p-form. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. This is now a p-form. Then, um, then you define g of p to be equal to the, those p-planes. Here they're oriented, but you can forget about the orientation. Of, so you drop the orientation. Well, I can put it this way. Is equal to, is equal to 1, okay? So either plus or minus because there's an orientation that doesn't matter here. This is just in the Grossmannian, not the oriented Grossmannian. So now this is, when you play this game, you then get 
you then get something which are called phi harmonic functions. In fact, in general, these things are called phi G pluri subharmonic functions. They're called G pluri subharmonic because they are they are G they are f of G pluri subharmonic if and only if the restriction to every affine G plane is subharmonic. So the definition would have absolute value of prime. Yeah. And because it doesn't make sense otherwise, this is not supposed to be oriented. So G pluri subharmonic functions are the ones which are ex exactly the ones which are subharmonic on G planes, on affine G planes. And they're exactly the ones which are subharmonic on any minimal G submanifold. That's a submanifold whose tangent planes are G planes. Um, so there are lots of interesting cases. I mean, if you take phi to be the Kähler form, And this gives you complex geometry. I mean, it, the, the usual pluri subharmonic functions and um, the, 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 the G submanifolds are just the complex curves. You can take powers of the divided powers of the Kähler form. Um, you can take phi to be equal to um, something like the Killing form on a Lie group, on a Lie group G. That's also a nice calibration. You can take phi to be um, the associative three form on the imaginary octonians. This is a so-called associative three form. It gives rise to a, a beautiful set of class of associative submanifolds. And the point is that there are associated associative subharmonic functions. And, and there's a notion of, of, of harmonic functions. And I'm going to talk about solving the Dirichlet problem for those corresponding harmonic functions. Um, Too many G numbers. What's the thing you might want to Yeah, I'm going to bring up <laughs> another G. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's going to get worse. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then another thing you can do is, is to look in CN and take the set of Lagrangian planes. So I, I don't have time to discuss this, but this is a very interesting case. So the Lagrangians, the Lagrangian n planes in C n, which is a compact subset of the Grassmannian of n planes in R two n, and so you can talk about Lagrangian subharmonic functions, and um, and Lagrangian convexity and so forth. And these these are also, and, and it turns out that the Lagrangian harmonic functions actually satisfy a very pretty non-trivial um, polynomial equation. Which, uh, which depends not on the Hermitian symmetric part of the matrix, but the, but the Hermitian skew symmetric part. And so there's this differential operator that, that, um, that actually defines Lagrangian branches of, and, and this one has branches as well, branches of the Lagrangian harmonic function. OK, so let me at least, oh god. All right, so I've got one more thing to state, and then I can Then I can give you the theorem. So this has to do with boundary convexity. So I'm going to assume that I have a, a domain omega with smooth boundary. And um, and I've, I'm given a, a subequation. Well, all right, and I'm given a subequation f. So the first thing one has to do, I'm given a subequation f. Then the first thing I want to do is to associate to this something called the asymptotic cone. And the asymptotic cone is a set of those a's which have the property that eventually they lie in f. Actually, you can take this cone from any base point. It doesn't have to be the origin, but I don't want to waste time. So you know, you've got, a, you've got this set f out here somewhere. And you look at those a's, which eventually lie in this subequation. So this is, this is called the asymptotic cone subequation that's, that's associated. This is, again, a subequation. 
and it's a comb. It satisfies the fact that Tf arrow is equal to F arrow for all T greater than or equal to zero. So it's a kind of simplification. It's like, it's like the, the tangent cone at infinity of your equation, right? Asymptotic cone. And it's only the asymptotic cone that counts for boundary convexity. So this, is, this asymptotic cone is a, is, a, is a simplification of the equation. And then and then you, then you say that a boundary is F arrow convex, so I'm going to say strictly F arrow convex. It's always, I'm always interested in strict. At a point on the boundary, if the following is true, if the second fundamental form of the boundary at the point X is equal to the restriction to the uh, to the, to the tangent space of the boundary, uh, for some b in the interior of f arrow. And there's an equivalent definition in terms of the normal, but I think I'll just leave it like this. Now, it could be that the second, well, yeah. Um, now, in this geometric case, it's really very nice. The geometric case G, one has that strict convexity means is convex if and only if um, when you take the trace of the second fundamental form of the boundary on restricted to a C, this is greater than or equal to zero. For all C contained in, actually contained in the tangent bundle to the boundary. So this convexity in, in this geometric case is, is very nice. I mean you So G here is associated with some calibration? G is just one of these compact subsets of, of the Grossmannian. It's a collection of compact set of of planes. And so if you Right. right, right, and so this is a, so, yeah. What is this then? With respect to a specific F, what is that F is that geometrical? I, I, I'm not so sure I follow the last part. Uh, okay, so we start with an equation F, right. then we take its asymptotic cone equation, and then the boundary is said to be strictly F convex, if at every point, when you take the second fundamental form with respect to the interior normal, with respect to the interior normal, then that, that's a quadratic form, real, real value quadratic form. It should be the restriction of some b in the interior of this equation. And then the, the next one, uh, uh -huh. On, on these G planes. And by the way, if, if there are no, ta if at a point there are no tangent G planes, then convexity holds. So th this, so, so, I mean, there are, there are cases when, you know, there are Gs where most of the tangent planes don't contain any special G planes, and then convexity is much easier to establish. Um, Yeah. So would like your set, you know, your F, uh, your F arrows to be somehow invent in your, you know, tangent space or something like that? Well, I mean, um. Well, for example, if you, you study certain equations, the, with, between several complex variables, it's important if the boundary is due to convex or not. And this is try, trying to generalize something like due to convexity or. Yeah. If you somehow embed it in some other space. Uh, up until now, everything was infinity. Mm hmm. Oh, but um, so, so you would like your B, your B, your tension, your interior of 
Well, I mean, if you, I mean, if you move this around by a diffeomorphism, everything still holds. Um, it's pretty intrinsic. I mean, when, you've got this f, which is an equation over your manifold, and then once you, whenever you take a hypersurface, it, it has the second fundamental form with respect to a given normal, and then this is this is something that has to do with the data of the f of of the equation and the hypersurface. And so, I mean, the hypersurface has to come into play. So the point, for example, if, if, if you take, as Claude says, if you, if you take this, the complex P, then this kind of convexity is just the usual pseudo-convexity of the boundary, which is invariant, you know, by, by good luck under the, by the local by whole morphisms, but in general, these calibrated geometries don't have, don't have nice transformation groups, except for translations. Uh, but nevertheless, there's still a notion of convexity for boundaries, and it's, and it's a very simple one. Um, so now the theorem. The main theorem is that, is the following. If you start with a and again, for the moment, this is just an Rn. So f is purely second order. And so the claim is if the boundary of omega omega is a domain in Rn with smooth boundary, if this is strictly f arrow and f dual arrow convex, then the Dirichlet problem is uniquely solvable. For all continuous boundary, boundary functions. Okay? So this includes all branches of the Mont-Jampere equation. Now, for one example is when you look at the qth branch of the of a complex or the real, let's say, the complex Mont-Jampere equation, then boundary convexity means, means something which is classical also in several complex variables. It means, uh, well, the integers get moved around, but it means Q pseudo convexity of the boundary. It means there's a local defining function which is locally Q, um, uh, uh, locally Q convex and um, Q pseudo-convex. And um, in this form, for this particular equation, this is an old result of Hunt and Murray. And then later, Sledkovsky. And um, it's actually the work of these guys that was an inspiration for what we're doing. And, um, and in the work of Hunt and Murray, they, they, the way they stated the theorem, they said that, that it worked for Q bigger than or equal to N over 2. And then they had a counterexample that showed that it didn't work for it less than or equal to Q. And the problem was that they weren't considering, they didn't sort of see the fact that you have, you have to have both F convexity and dual convexity. And sort of when Q dropped below the middle, then the dual went above and so forth. So you, you really needed them. You really need them both. Often Q convexity, often convexity, one convexity implies another. Depends which way it goes. So um, now the there are various ways to prove this, and the way I was hoping <laughs> to discuss is something that uses Slidkowski's the deep the deep part of the proof of this is um, is the um, uh, largest eigenvalue theorem of Slutkowski. This is a this is an amazing result, and um, it applies to convex functions. So convex functions have have are twice differentiable almost everywhere. And so Slutkowski wrote down a, a sort of obvious candidate for the for the largest eigenvalue of any convex function. You know, you, you subtract off the, you look at a point where it's differentiable, which is almost everywhere. You subtract off the linear part, you divide by, you divide by epsilon squared, 
you take a certain limit, rim soup, as you go to zero. And, um, and that gives you a function which is well-defined. And what he proved was that if that function is greater than or equal to some constant almost everywhere, then it's greater than or equal to that constant everywhere it's defined. And, um, and that is really the, the linchpin of proving this, this result. So I don't, I don't have time to go into it now. But oh, that together with a kind of standard technique, which is quasi-convex approximation. I mean, now you consider the class of functions which are not convex, which would have, have the property when you, when you add norm, norm of x lambda times norm of x squared to them, they become convex. These are called quasi-convex. In fact, they're just what you get when you take p, this, I guess I call it, p, and you add a constant to it. <laughs> it's that subequation. Okay? And, um, and then there's something called subconvolution, which you can do to any upper semi continuous function. Subconvolution gives you a nice family of quasi convex functions that, that converge. And using quasi convex approximation and Slikovsky's theorem, you can prove. First, the subaffine theorem for quasi-convex, and then the subaffine theorem in general, and you can prove, and then that implies existence. Okay. Um, maybe I should say one last word. Um, of course, it's a classical thing that when you have, um, that if you want to prove existence for the Dirichlet problem, you want to construct what are called barrier functions. Okay. And the main point is that that at any point on the boundary, you want to find a function which is, which is in the right class and, and nicely behaved you know, with respect to your given boundary value in a neighborhood of this point. And these barrier functions can be constructed precisely under these conditions, the barrier functions that you need. So the brief explanation of the proof is that these actually give rise to barrier functions, which allow you to, to make most of the steps in um, in giving a, in giving existence, and then um, and then the rest is is done by the the largest eigenvalue theorem. All right, so maybe I should quit for ten minutes. <laughs> maybe by way of laying out the land, <coughs> the bottom line of what I want. <clears throat> of what I'd like to say is the following. So this is just this. Suppose X is a Ramanian manifold with a topological G structure. And I'll say what that is in a moment. But G is a Lie group. Okay? But topological G structure does not mean that the holonomy of the Ramanian metric lies in G. It simply means that, um, that there is a reduction of the, of, the, of the structure group ON, topological reduction, to the structure group G. But is everything G smooth? Like Everything's smooth, yeah. yeah. So another, another way of saying it is that there's a principal G bundle contained in the bundle of orthonormal frames. Where respecting the, the embedding of G into ON. And then you suppose that you have here a constant coefficient subequation. And now I am talking about, so this is really, this is, this is just a condition on R, P, and A. So there's no dependence on X. Okay. And whenever, and I'm going to assume that G is contained in, in fact, I might as well assume that it's equal to um, the set of G in the orthogonal group, which preserve this set. Okay. Then my claim is that whenever this is true, there's a notion of boundary convexity, just as I mentioned before. And the Dirichlet problem, <coughs> then essentially, then essentially all uh, the, the Dirichlet problem carries over. C 
So, so just to give you the flavor of, because I can't do the details, to give you the flavor, um, suppose, <coughs> so an example, let's let x, let x be a, an almost complex, an almost complex Hermitian manifold. So it's an almost complex manifold. It has this tensor J. And then you would take a Ramanian metric, which is J invariant. Take any Ramanian me metric, you can always make it J invariant by averaging over this little group. OK? Hermitian metric. Then you can solve a Dirichlet problem for all branches of the complex Mongean pair equation, provided that you have the right boundary convexity. DP for the complex mon jam here. In fact, all branches and uh, another example is suppose X is parallelizable. Then, then. This is a, a kind of trivial structure, and so sort of all equations, all f's carry over. Now, hidden in here is this the statement that I made before. You have to have you have to have a boundary with boundary appropriate boundary convexity, both for f and for the dual equation. Um, and there is a second ingredient that gets involved. Um, maybe I will have time to mention that. Um, but this is the spirit. Oh, maybe a third example is if, if f is on invariant, you know, g equals on, okay? So it's an on invariant equation, which, which I was emphasizing, right? Well, so all of these on invariant equations, they, um, they carry over to any Ramanian manifold. Ramanian X. And sometimes it becomes kind of unlikely to find any, I mean, the boundary conditions would be more difficult to, 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 to satisfy in this context if you're, for example, looking at, at pseudo convexity for almost complex manifolds or something. Um, fairly unlikely. No, I think that the, 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 the boundary convexity is, is again soft. I mean, it's equivalent to the existence of a sort of cure. Yes, right. Yeah. Then that follows from. Well, you have to be careful. I, when the dependent variable is involved, then. But if it's a pure second-order equation, yeah, then, then, that's right. Any any domain with convex boundary. Um, but there is a second wrinkle, and that has to do with something called monotonicity um, cones. I mean, you can't. You have to add a second. There's a second issue, which I'm, I hope I'll have a chance to, to address. Um, but let me, let me just remind you quickly of what happens for a Ramanian manifold. So if I have a Ramanian manifold x, then there's something called the Ramanian Hessian, the Hessian of a function u. I'm assuming u is c2. This is, this is an element um, in. In, it's a symmetric quadratic form on the tangent space. When it sees a pair of tangent vectors, you extend them to local vector fields, and then you take the w derivative of u, then the v derivative of u, and you subtract off the covariant derivative of v with respect to w. That's with the Levi-Civita connection. That's a new vector field. You apply that to u. Now, this is evidently a tensor in, in v, and it's symmetric because for the Ramanian connection, the difference of covariant, the com commutator of covariant differentiation is the, the Lie bracket. So this is a, and if you write this locally, it's an important fact. If you write this with respect to, well, I won't write down. And it's, it's, it has a simple expression with respect to the Christoffel symbols. But now, important fact is that this gives you 
a splitting of the two jet bundle. So this always splits off. That's the dependent variable. And then you have the cotangent bundle. But this is, you also now have sim2 of the cotangent bundle. And this simply takes j2 of a function u uh, becomes at x becomes u at x du at x. And now here you take the Hessian, the Ramanian Hessian of u at x. It's Whitney sum, right? It's Whitney sum. Yeah. Fiber product. All right. So now, um, now you notice that if you have a <coughs> suppose this is an orthonormal, well, any any tangent frame, frame, a frame field for the tangent bundle of x restricted to some open set u, u an open subset in nx. Okay. <coughs> then you get a, then you get j2 of u becomes trivialized. I mean, this gives you a trivialization of the tangent bundle, right? And, but this gives you a trivialization of the, of the two jet bundle. So this becomes u cross r cross rn. Now it is cross R and cross sim two, where for a function u, you associate to it u at x, and then here you apply e1 to u at x up to en to u at x. And then you put in here the, the matrix, which is the Hessian applied to ei, ej. So you get the symmetric matrix with respect to this frame. And now, if you look at a change of framing, if you have a change of framing, then the change of framing, the action of the action of, the, of GLN, G is a change of frame. Then the, the change of trivialization sends, um, sends, I'll do it in these coordinates. It goes to R, and then you get G applied to P, and you get G, A, G transpose. Okay, so this is the action that you want of the general linear group on this space, on the trivializations. Okay, now if we're in this situation where we take, a, we take a, an equation which has an invariance group G, then <coughs> what I mean by a topological reduction topological G structure, that's faster, a topological G structure on X can be thought of very simply as the following. It's, a, it's an open cover with the property that, and with a frame field, E alpha, an orthonormal, distinguished orthonormal frame field on U alpha for each alpha, right? and with, with the property that the change of frame, which I'll write as G alpha beta mapping U alpha intersect U beta in general, it's into the orthogonal group. It should have its values in G. So you're saying that this information is enough to determine the topological G structure. Right. That's yeah. What right. It's, a, it's like presenting coordinate charts, a finite atlas. So this is a finite atlas for the G structure. Okay. So you can think of, um, you know, if you have a Hermitian metric and an almost complex tensor J, it's very easy to 
to give yourself the appropriate permission orthonormal. You get E's and JE's, and transition functions will all be in the unitary group. OK, but now, whenever you have such a thing, then because F is invariant, then you get, by the change of frame, this gives rise to gives a well-defined subequation. Should get out some new chalk. On X, so it's the, we're, I, we like to call this the uh, G universal subequation on X. Defined by capital F. Okay? And it's simply given by the fact that when you when you have a local coordinate chart over which you have one of these frames, then then when you apply this to it, it should always lie in this constant coefficient. Locally it's it's just a statement that that this is true. So it almost looks like a constant coefficient equation, but the, but the problem is that um, the Hessian now involves the Christoffel symbols, right? This, this Hessian in local coordinates, it looks, the Hessian looks, the Hessian looks like d squared u dx i dx j minus the, Chris, the sum over k, the Christoffel symbol j um, ij k du dx k. So you have this additional term that depends on the first derivative. That's what the Hessian looks like in local coordinates. So when you write it out, you get, the, you get terms involving the Christoffel symbols. But they're mild and they're treatable. And that's why it works. Um, OK, so now. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. So now let me say a word about boundary convexity. So omega is oh. So again, given f, f gives rise to in, ge in full generality to a certain f arrow, and this is now more generally defined, but it's, it's again a, a cone. And then I can tell you what convexity means. So the definition now is that d omega is f arrow convex if, um, if let's put it this way, if you, if you, um, if you take the value 0, r equals 0. Here you put the normal vector to, to the boundary. And here you put t times projection onto the normal direct sum, the second fundamental form of the boundary. This should be in the interior of f arrow. This is for st strict f convexity. So this is the unit normal outer normal. So this is like the second form of convexity that I, that I wrote down. Um, so it's entirely in terms of the second fundamental form. But it's equivalent to the fact that there exists, there exists some local defining function which is strictly f arrow subharmonic. That's what you want. And then given that, you can actually juice it up a little bit and find something which is you can find a family of things which are actually f subharmonic defined in terms of this local defining function. So you get barriers. So when you write oh, project, you just mean the, the, the dual one form thing with its index lower? Uh, yeah, I mean the unit, yes, right. I mean the dual one form, right. That's right. So this is actually <coughs> very computable. I, if you take uh, it, it certainly agrees with all the ones that I mentioned before, the ones that come from calibrations and so forth. 
But if you take the Laplace operator, then every boundary is strictly convex, both f and f arrow convex. The Laplace operator f is equal to f tilde, um, is equal to f arrow. If you look at the p Laplacian, and this is the thing that you get by varying the, the p Laplacian is, but it's, oh, I'm not going to write that. But the p Laplacian, you get a family of p Laplacians from 1 to infinity, including infinity. Every boundary is strictly, those are self-dual equations, and every boundary is strictly f arrow and f arrow dual convex, every boundary. And if you take the minimal surface equation, the hypersurface equation, the classical one in, in Euclidean space, then that makes sense on a Ramanian manifold. If you think about it, it's just has, you just have to know what the Hessian is and the, and the norm of the gradient. Then this boundary convexity means that, that um, the mean curvature points inward. It's the usual thing. It has to be strictly, mean curvature has to be strictly positive. So it's, it, it, it gives you what you want in all the classical cases but it makes sense in complete generality. So again, the theorem that you want is going to require that the boundary be strictly f arrow and f tilde arrow convex. Now there's a, but there's a second problem. I mean, if you're not in something like Euclidean space, you're on some general Ramanian manifold, you can take the nicest boundary you like and then just change the metric <laughs> any way whatsoever inside and you're pretty much going to, to get rid of any chance of making the general statement, right? I'm a little bit confused about the double appearance of n in this formula. So this is supposed to be an element that's uh, supposed to be a p-jack. So the, the second derivative piece is the second fundamental form. The second derivative. Are you supposed to, to, is that supposed to be squared, prod n squared, or to be a quadratic thing? It's n, n tensor n, if you like. Yeah, it's, it's orthogonal projection onto the normal, oh, okay. onto the normal so space. The normal, so it's n tensor n. Okay. n tensor n. Where n is thought of as a, as a one form. n is thought of as a one form. Okay. Yeah. Well, you had n tensor n dual or something. <laughs> right, yeah. But, you know, we put a metric in this. So this is an orthogonal splitting, and this means projection, orthogonal projection onto the normal. Okay. Um, projection. Now, so as I say, I mean, <coughs> if, if you're given a boundary in some general Ramanian manifold, and uh, suppose you just want to look at one of these O-N invariant functions, uh, equations, and the boundary is perfectly nice, say it's actually convex, then you can come along and and do anything to the metric in here. You haven't changed the things on the boundary. And it seems a little hopeless that you would be able to make a general statement. You need something. OK, so this is what's called a monotonicity cone. Well, not if it's a universal one. See, suppose I give you something which is defined just, which is an O-N invariant equation, then it makes perfect sense on any Ramanian manifold. See, the local frames are just orthonormal frames. And so, so, for example, the, the, the real homogeneous Mont-Jampere equation makes perfect sense on any, on any Ramanian manifold. You change the metric, it still makes sense. And it's the same equation where you haven't changed it. But it's sort of, it's a very different geometry where you have changed it. So, so Mm -hmm. Then, if you vary the metric inside, surely you have some condition that's just on the second derivative. Um, nonetheless, the, the way that you pulled off the, the first derivative piece in order to define the Hessian was saying that you changed the metric. It's just that it, it's just that the it, it's just that the geometry the geometry can be expanded, and so even though you're solving the same equation, the geometry may or may not allow you to solve. The problem is that the well, I mean, there are counterexamples, which are actually rather, rather mild geometrically. But if you take, look at the three sphere and take a, a, a tube of fixed distance from, from a great circle and uh, take a product of two of those things, 
Those things have all kinds of convexity conditions, but the but but comparison fails. Uh, there are t there are distinct solutions to the Dirichlet problem, and it's because sort of these these tubes, the interior of these tubes, the geometry doesn't allow you to to start with certain boundary data and extend a solution. It's uh, it's the geometry that gets in the way. Equation is the same, but the equation is measuring the geometry. If you think about it that way. Okay, so uh, so anyway, there's this there's a notion of ebbs, uh, f subharmonic function. I'm sorry, there's a, no, uh, no, a notion of an, uh, a monotonicity cone. So m is a it's a it's a subequation that uh, has the property that m x is a convex cone with vertex at the origin for every point. Okay, so it's a convex cone, so it's actually a nice subequation, and then it's a monotonicity cone for f if this is satisfied. Okay, so monotonicity cones. If you have a now, there are lots and lots of I, I would need more time to convince you that this is natural, but. For Ramanian equations, for example, the, the, it's always true that convex functions will, you know, the p is a monotonicity cone. And in the Hermitian case, then the Hermitian p, the complex p, or the quaternionic p in the quaternionic case, those are all monotonicity cones for all the, the nice functions of this Hermitian symmetric part. And so, for example, if you're in an almost complex manifold uh, and you have some plurisubharmonic function in the almost complex sense, it makes good sense, then that gives you, that gives you what you need sort of for all, these, all those equations. So the theorem is that if um, you suppose that f is g universal, and um, you assume that the boundary is f arrow and f tilde arrow strictly convex, and uh, okay, and maybe I'll put this here. And there exists a strictly m subharmonic function. Where m is a monotonicity cone. No, 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 it just has to be defined, not at all. So it's, you know, if, if you're on a kind of almost Stein manifold, it would be a, but you don't need that. It just has to be some strictly subharmonic function. Then the Dirichlet problem is uniquely solvable. For all phi continuous functions on the boundary. Okay, so, um, and the, the method of proof does not use quasi-convex approximation because th that's something very special to homogeneous manifolds. So here, here one has to do something very different, and the, the main tool is the celebrated theorem on sums. If you've ever wandered into viscosity theory, this is the workhorse. And there's a version of the theorem on sums which you can adapt to this situation. Use the fact that, that, the, that the equation is, subequation is relatively mild. It's constant coefficients, but not quite. Your Hessian isn't the usual Hessian. It's modified by, by something like this. And, um, Right, right. Yes, it has two parts. So the solvable part is the same. You look at the Perron function. You take this function, which is, I didn't even say it before, but you know, you, you take this function, which is the soup over u, which is the soup of all uh, u, u in this family, and the family is by definition, um, the set of upper semi the set of elements that are f subharmonic, 
on the, on the domain with a property that restricted to the boundary the less than or equal to phi. This is, is goes back to complex analysis one, right? To take then do the Perron method, you use and then you use the boundary to, to construct barriers, and then you have to you have to get a, a, a form of comparison. So if you can establish comparison, then so maybe I should s at least say what comparison is. So the way it goes is that. Comparison is the statement that if u is in f of x and v is in f tilde of x, then that implies that they satisfy the zero maximum principle. The zero maximum principle, and that is that u plus v less than or equal to zero on the boundary of a compact set implies that u plus v is less than or equal to zero on k. It's, it's important that you choose zero. Now, now, take it from me that if you can prove this, where these are general upper semi-continuous functions, then you're really home free. Okay? And all of the difficulty is in establishing comparison. Now, if one of these things is smooth, there's no problem. The problem is when, so in fact, if one of them is strict, it's no problem. And so you have to have a notion of what it means for an upper semi-continuous subharmonic function to be strictly subharmonic, but it's not that hard to do. And then one of the main, then there's a little lemma that local, local strict comparison, local, well, we say if, you can, if one of these is allowed to be strict, then you call that weak comparison. And one of the theorems is that weak comparison, is that weak local comparison implies uh, weak comparison. So weak comparison is where one of these is allowed to be strict. And if you just have it locally, then you have it globally. That's an important fact, because it's, then you can establish it locally using this. And then there's a statement that weak comparison globally plus strict approximation implies comparison. And strict approximation means that every subharmonic function can be uniformly approximated by strictly subharmonic functions on every compact set. And you get that whenever you have one of these, uh, whenever you have one of these m subharmonic functions. If you have one of these m subharmonic functions, you sort of add epsilon times this guy and let epsilon go to zero, and it gives you strict approximation. And so. And then once you, have, once you have comparison, then it's still a long argument, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a general one. Okay, so that's all I had to say. Thanks. <laughs>